Alright, hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of the 411 Ground and Pound MMA podcast. As usual, we are your weekly look into the wide, wacky, wonderful world of mixed martial arts. Uh, please, I, I hate to be the guy who says this every time. And I hate that I do it because it's one of the dumbest things you can do, and I hate when other people do it, but apparently it works. So, if you would please interact with the product a little bit. Like, comment, subscribe, share, rate, any and all of it. Always helpful. Uh, yeah, just got to get that out of the way because, again, apparently it works. So I'm going to just keep saying it, I guess. <laughs> all right. Uh, I'm Robert Winfrey. I'm your host. So thank you all very much. On the agenda this evening, last night, there was a UFC event. It uh, wasn't very good, but we'll go over it briefly. This coming weekend, ooh, baby, we have a big one. UFC 259. Mm. Stacked card, three title fights featuring four UFC champions. Uh, yeah, I am, I am psyched. I am looking forward to that particular card. Uh, if you're not, I would question why you watch the sport. <laughs> uh, that that's uh, just a really really good set set of fights we have. Also, little bit of news this week. Um, some movement on the welterweight title picture. Some on the women's flyweight title picture, and Dana White continues to pretend to be an ostrich. So we'll go over that, such as it is. Uh, yeah, that's what I've got. All right, let us begin. This should be a fairly quick bit here. Last night, UFC on ESPN plus 44. Main event. Uh, first of all, let's start with this. There were only nine fights on that card. <laughs> um... We lost a bunch. Uh, we lost a fight between Alex Oliveira and Ramazan uh, Kermagomedov. Some illness on the part of Kermagomedov. We lost Alonzo Menafield versus William Knight. Uh, Menafield had a positive COVID test, so they're trying to reschedule that. And we lost Angela Hill versus Ashley Yoder. That... Uh, that... Day of, like a couple of hours, like, I forget exactly when. Uh, but same day, a few hours before the event, we uh, that got announced. Uh, one of Yoder's, yeah, one of Yoder's cornermen tested positive for COVID. Uh, so they're moving that around. Uh, yeah. Just a. Uh, uh, I mean, there were other fights earlier in this particular process of this card that wound up being scrapped for one reason or another. But nine fights, so there was that. Uh, to compensate, you see, we couldn't have had a nice quick event. We just couldn't have done it. So of the nine fights, eight of them went the distance, including the main event. Yay! Oh, boy. Some of them were good fights. I, mean, I, I've long said a finish doesn't make a fight good, and a decision going the distance doesn't mean it's bad. In fact, some of the, if you think of all the best fights you've ever seen, most of them go long. Not all, but you know, the vast majority. And certainly, once we get to like the very best fights, I think almost all of them are decisions. Uh, I'd have to double check, and that list will vary depending on who you are. But you just kind of think of the best ones off the top of your head. Uh, anyway, main event, Cyril Gaon defeated Jarzinho Rosenstroik via unanimous decision, 50-45 across the board. This was a very, very dull fight. Gaon was uh, better at maintaining distance, so he kept things at the range he wanted to keep them at. Avoided damage, forced clinches on occasion, kept probing at Rosenstroik, and Rosenstroik kept just not doing much of anything. Not an engaging fight from Gon, but he fought over five rounds, proved he could do so, took no damage, uh, remains undefeated. The man didn't, almost certainly did not win any new fans with this performance, but this was a very, very important win for him. He got it, and you know, the winning is uh, kind of the most important thing, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Very, very boring fight. A uh, lot of nothing. A lot of nothing. Uh, sucked for Rosenstroik. You know, the, 
He needs to figure some stuff out. Gone. Uh, I think he joked after the fight that, well, you know, if something happens to either Rose, to either uh, Stipe or Francis, I'm happy to fight for the belt. Sure, it would be. He's probably going to need another win or two, uh, kind of depending on who he fights. You could do him and Derek Lewis. Uh, wouldn't be completely out of bounds. Uh, it's just kind of a thought. So, yeah, solid, very important win for Gon, but not an engaging fight. Uh, speaking of not engaging fights, Magomed Ankalaev defeated Nikita Krylov via unanimous decision, 29-28. Uh, bit of a, not a rough first round for Ankalaev, but he dropped it. Um, had some good moments in it, but ultimately got taken down and kind of struggled off of his back for a period. Second round, uh, he was the one who started forcing clinches and takedowns. Pretty clearly won the second and third. Ankalaev remains one of the, uh, you know, newer rising guys in that division. Not the most engaging performance, but, you know, he's on a long winning streak. Give him a... Give him somebody of a bit of note next. You know, this puts him into the. This should put him into the top ten. And you know, while the UFC light heavyweight division is not exactly a sterling example of robust, uh, yeah, or a talent depth, this should probably get him because you know, he was 11 coming into this. Krylov was eight. Give him uh, Anthony Smith maybe. Let's see, Prohachka's got a fight coming up. I think he's fighting Rakic. So someone like Smith or Uzdemir, they're currently both 6 and 7, respectively. Uh, maybe the loser of, I want to say it's Prohachka and, Ra- and Rakic, the loser of that fight. But can we just, let's stop wasting on Kalaev's time. You know, he's one of the few bright spots this division has for the future. Uh... Maria Bueno Silva defeated Montana, uh, excuse me, and Montana De La Rosa fought to a majority draw. There was one 28-27 for Bueno Silva, which I think the judge gave Bueno Silva a 10-8 third, which I just didn't see. Uh, the issue here is Bueno Silva had a point deducted in the first round for grabbing the fence to prevent a takedown. It was a fair point deduction. I'm not going to get into that. I, I take no issue with it. Uh, but that gave, for all three judges, De La Rosa the first round 10-8. I actually gave the first round to Buena Silva, but I, I don't stand by that. So I had the first round 9-9, nine, nine, and then Buena Silva pretty clearly wins rounds 2 and 3. Uh, yeah, sucks for her, but, you know, try not to cheat. It'll help. Now, the fight itself was all right. See, Pedro Munoz and Jimmy Rivera defeated Jimmy Rivera via unanimous decision, 230-27s, 129-28. Uh, really nice little three-round fight between these two. Munoz chewed up Rivera with leg kicks. Rivera swinging heavy, heavy leather. He cracked Munoz several times, but Pedro Munoz just has a cinder block for a head. I mean, Munoz has never been stopped. He's never been stopped at all. I'm pretty sure he's never been stopped via strikes. Yeah, he's only lost in the UFC, and he's only ever lost decisions. Uh, yeah. He ate ate some pretty serious punches from Jimmy Rivera. Would have badly hurt anyone else, but because Munoz, again, has a cinder block head, worked out for him. Uh, Fun fight. This was technically a rematch. Uh, Rivera beat Munoz back in, like, 15-16. Uh, via split decision, they fight here. Throw those two in the main event of fight night. You know, you could. There are a lot. There are plenty of worse main events that you could make. In fact, arguably, you had a worse one here than that fight. Give those two two more rounds. Ah oh, man. So solid win for Munoz. Uh, this was your fight of the night. Really good fight. Look this one up. Uh, also, kicking off the main card, Alex Caceres defeated Kevin Kroom via unanimous decision, 230-26s, 130-27. Uh, I don't have a whole lot for this one. Kroom just kind of trying to get takedown, struggling to do so, struggling to get control on the occasions he did. Caceres just kind of pot-shotting him on the way in, defending takedowns. Uh, it was what it was. It was uninteresting, mid-level stuff. 
On the prelims, Tiago Moises defeated Alexander Hernandez via unanimous decision. 230-27s, 129-28. Uh, this would be... There's three fights I recommend people look up from this card. Munoz Rivera, Moises Hernandez, and we'll get to it in a second, Ronnie Lawrence and Vince Cachero. Uh, Moises and Hernandez had a really fun little fight here. Moises just... Uh, Seemed content to let Hernandez waste a lot of time and energy with feints that didn't actually lead to anything. Counter-strike him a little bit. Busted up his face. Uh, not badly, but clearly marked him up. Good leg kicks when he wanted to use them. Uh, good defense and then countering. Moises is pretty legit. Uh, a lot of people overlook him. He was the underdog here, in point of fact. But his only UFC... he lost his UFC debut when he fought Benil Daryush, got a win, then fought Demiris Magulov and lost, and since then has won three in a row. And submitted Michael Johnson, beat Bobby Green, now beat Alexander Hernandez. Moises is legit. I don't know exactly how far he's going to go, but that is no one to trifle with. Uh, women's bantamweight. Alexis Davis defeated Sabina Mazo via unanimous decision, 230-27s, 130-26. Mazza was kind of having her way with Davis on the feet in the first round and then threw a body kick for reasons that will forever remain a mystery to me. Davis caught it, took her down, and was just vastly superior on the ground. And then from that point, just kind of kept, was able to find... Davis never actively pursued the takedown. Mazzo kept not liking the way things were going on the striking or just has such a habit of throwing kicks that she couldn't stop herself from throwing them. And inevitably, Davis would catch one and take her down and then just dominate position on the ground. Uh, questionable decision-making from Mazo, to say the least, as far as that goes. Uh, bantamweight fight, our only finish of the entire night. Ronnie Lawrence defeated Vince Cachero via TKO. This was just hammer fists and punches on the ground. Uh, 238 of the third. Ronnie Lawrence might be a problem for that division. <laughs> he moves very well. He did here, at least. His wrestling... Uh, there's some guys at Bantamweight who have motors when it comes to wrestling. Who will get you and will get you down, and if they can't secure position, they'll mat return you. They are relentless about it. Uh, kind of factor Ronnie Lawrence into that group of guys. You know, guys like Ricky Simone and, uh, Marab Dwalish really are others. Just relentless guys. Uh, pay attention to that guy. Yeah, he, he ragdolled Cachero, and then Cachero just kept wearing down until he got finished in the third. Kicking off the main card, Dustin Jake uh, Jacoby, I believe is how he prefers it pronounced, defeated Maxim Grishin via unanimous decision, 29-28. Thing here was Grishin missed weight. He weighed 210.5. Uh, first, to Grishin's credit, this is his first time in 40-some-odd professional fights missing weight, but it's not. that's a non-trivial miss. And you don't often see guys miss at light heavyweight. That that not unheard of, but it's a bit of an oddity. Uh, decent enough fight for the first round. Then both guys just kind of started slowing down. Jacoby just kept kind of picking at Grishin. Leg kicks, long range stuff, avoid takedowns, rinse, repeat. So apart from those three fights, kind of a nondescript uh, event, all things considered. Uh, yeah, I, I don't have a whole lot here. Uh, so thanks to everyone who read my coverage. Uh, to everyone who's read the full report. Deeply appreciate all of you. They can't all be winners. I, I just do the best that I can with what I've got when it comes to both writing it up and talking about it. So, uh, moving on. UFC 259. Ooh, buddy. Woo. This is a heck of a fight. Oh, Santos. It's Rakich and Santos. Who is Prochka fighting? I swear he had a fight lined up. Eh, doesn't matter. It'll come to me or I'll see it at some point. Or or they should just make uh, Ankalaev and Prochka. <laughs> like you could just make that fight, in theory. All right. 259. Solid main card. I mean, that that's what... On paper, that is a great main card. There's no filler, depending on how you feel about Amanda Nunes and Megan Anderson, I suppose. But that's a title fight, so you have to get a little, a, a degree of leeway as far as that goes, I suppose. Anyway, main event for the light heavyweight title. Newly minted champion Jan Blahovich will fight middleweight champion Israel Adesanya. 
I I am looking forward to this fight. Uh, Blahovich's career turnaround. Uh, he's kind of he did it kind of quietly recently before going on before going on to win the belt. Uh, even then, he's had some ups and downs. You know, he started his UFC career two and six. Uh, not a great look. But since then, he kind of figured it out. Since then, he's gone eight and one. The only loss being to Tiago Santos. A fight I, given the knee injury to Santos, I don't know that I, I don't know that I would pick Santos if they were to rematch. Santos is just kind of a bad matchup for Blahovich. Uh, whether again, whether that would still be the case or not, uh, would have to wait until they potentially fought again. Uh, but Blahovich coming off of that win over Reyes when he stopped him in the second round. He knocked out Corey Anderson before that. He had that real, real dud of a fight against Jacare. But that was an odd one, man. That was a really odd fight. Uh, Blahovich has gained a lot of notoriety over his last little bit as a knockout artist. Uh, and the man clearly has power. I don't mean to downplay that, but uh, he also does. He's a very competent grappler. Uh, he's pretty darn good. I mean, he's been out wrestled. That's been a bit. Being on the bottom is bad for him. Uh, Corey Anderson in their first fight out wrestled him. Gustafson out wrestled him. Patrick Cummins out wrestled him. Uh, even in fights he's won, that's been a problem for him on occasion. Uh, but he's he's developed power. He's good on top. If he's the one who can get you down, his takedown game just isn't all that great. Which is a problem if he's going to be on the wrong end of the striking. Now, whether he is or not against Adesanya in terms of practicality remains to be seen. He is certainly at a technical deficit based on all available evidence. Uh, Israel Adesanya might be the... I tend to think he's the most sophisticated striker the sport has ever seen. He, uh, uh, he's a remarkable, remarkable fighter. There's not too many people who will you know, faint the way he does, will gather information the way he does. He's really good about sniping at you. He's good from either stance. And he, once he figures out your openings, he's really good about punishing you. I mean, he dissected Robert Whitaker when Whitaker was undefeated at middleweight. Uh, Paulo Costa had just straight up nothing for him. Uh, the Gastelum fight was... An interesting one. Gastelum kind of caught him a little bit early, and against anyone like Adesanya, establishing some kind of threat early is of critical importance. Once he kind of gets his read on you, things just go downhill unless you're able to switch gears. That's one of the things about the Gastelum fight that really stood out to me re-watching it. Gastelum had that you know, kind of moment of success in the first, then Adesanya wins the second and third pretty handily, Adesanya is then winning the fourth, and Gastelum is able to upend him by doing something he hadn't done all fight and had done very, very infrequently throughout his entire career when he threw a head kick. <laughs> if you've got something like that in your back pocket, or the ability to just completely and radically depart from everything you've done for the previous X number of minutes in a fight, uh, anyone who relies on their reads like that, that can throw them off. I'm not so sure Blahovich has that in him. Uh, Blahovich kicks very hard. He punches very hard. I don't mean to diminish that. He's an ag Blahovich is a fairly aggressive guy. Uh, if he's the one backing up, he's a little bit in trouble, but he blitzes. Uh, he's good about kind of... He's a little bit repetitive with his attacks, which is a problem when you're fighting someone like Adesanya. But... Uh, He's good about attacking. He's good about attacking in combination most of the time. Uh, again, the knock there being that he tends to throw the same combination repeatedly, but uh, he's a smart enough guy to have potentially addressed this relative to fighting Adesanya. Uh, fighting at, at distance, I favor Adesanya here. He's good about kicking and jabbing long. He's good about reading. Uh, I... 
as far as picks go, I lean Adesanya. But I will not be surprised if Blahovich wins. Uh, Blahovich is a he's a big guy, man. He's not the tallest, but that is a very very thick man, and he has power. He kicks hard. He punches hard. And if you give him an opening, and he's able to take it, he will. Uh, he's good about and he's good about kicking both low, uh, more to the body. Blahovich doesn't throw a tremendous amount of leg kicks. Unless he's really engaged in kind of a chess match situation. And he very rarely throws head kicks. But he's good about kicking to the body. He closes a lot of combinations with body kicks. That's what he was landing that kept kind of... Br that really bruised up Dominic Reyes' ribs. Was just any time Reyes would kind of evade a blitz and then try to exit off to his own left. Uh, Jan would just kind of send him on his way with a punt to the body. Uh... I, I just have a really hard time. Somebody's going to... I mean, look. No one is unbeatable. Everybody loses eventually. At this point in time, I'm... And Adesanya has been knocked out in kickboxing. And he's lost some boxing fights. He can be outstruck. But only... I tend to think that that's happened when he's been fighting on... In those kind of real, like, razor-thin... Uh, not just thin, like, razor-refined... Uh, fighting sports you know boxing is boxing is fascinating because it is a very narrow uh, because it's a very narrow skill set so everything you do is refined to the nth degree everything you do matters so much more when you're dealing with such a narrow thing mma is kind of the opposite you have everything at your disposal essentially so the little things tend to matter not quite as much because there's so much other material you can draw on, so many other tactics you can uh, employ, other decisions you can make, etc. And anytime we're dealing with stuff that broad, uh, Adesanya's got a lot of tools, man. Uh, I I just lean towards Adesanya. Again, that's not the same as picking him, or that's not the same as you know being shocked if he loses. The power of Blahovich is a real problem, and if Blahovich comes out and is able to kind of offset Adesanya's rhythms or catch him early, uh, that that's when Adesanya's kind of at his most vulnerable. Early when he's still making reads, or once he's made his reads, and then you're able to switch gears. And you're able to throw throw a monkey wrench into the... throw a spanner into the works, as the saying goes. So, I... I just, I'm not sure that I've ever seen Blahovich really change up like that. He tends to have something that will work for him, either in, uh, usually somewhat incrementally, but uh, some strategy of I'm going to attack like this, I'm using this combination, I'm waiting for this opening or this entry, and then I will, I will counter it or you know, something like that, and then he just repeats it, which is what the vast majority of, I mean, Combat sports in general are all about patterns. You find something that works for you and you repeat it, or you find something your opponent does and you exploit it. And I just think that's a really, really rough uh, kind of mindset to have to fight someone like Adesanya, who's so good about messing with that. I mean, it's what John Jones does too, uh, to one de to a, a couple of degrees. John is not pattern dependent in his uh, in his fights. In fact, that's one of the most annoying things to try and fight about John, is that he, there's so much variance in his offense, and it's so, he disrupts rhythm. You know, he doesn't fight on the same rhythm, on the same pace. Most people do. Most people will find a, they'll find a rhythm they like to strike in, they'll find a couple of combinations they like, they'll go, and you find, again, you do find some variance in this, but it's very much pattern and rhythm based. And John is very much neither of those. It's a high variety of offense. It's, uh, again, at different times while uh, stopping you from doing anything effective uh, with your offense. And that's really hard to beat. Adesanya is more offense-minded than John, but Adesanya is a little bit of the same thing. You don't... It's not that Adesanya never throws in combination. He does, but it's... N you don't see it as often as other guys. Jan, when you look at most of his strikes... He's either very clearly one and done. I throw a kick. I throw a punch. Or he's got a three to four punch blitzing attack going. 
Or, you know, punch, 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 kick as you try to exit. And that's, that is a little bit his pattern as far as that goes. Now, the degree to which he can change that up, we'll have to see. Because Adesanya, the more predictable you are, the worse your night is against Adesanya. I mean, that, that's one of the things that cost Paulo Costa so much. Uh, he was just predictable. And that's the worst thing to be against that guy. That might be that might up that might straight up be the worst thing to be against Adesanya is readable like that. Uh, I mean that's where Romero found a degree of success against him. He just Romero would not react to any of Adesanya's fakes, feints wouldn't give him anything to read, and then just on occasion fired a single booming counter. And eventually Adesanya you know found a way around that, but you know, that stopping him from getting reads you you pretty much have to give him nothing. Uh, and Jan, I just don't think Jan's going to give him nothing. Uh, Jan could, again, Jan could catch him. Jan can win this fight. I don't mean to short sell the man's abilities. Uh, he's the champion. He is the champion for a reason. A uh, couple of reasons, some of them very good. And that's not to be discounted. You know, you know, again, discount that man at your own peril. Uh, I will not discount Jan Blahovich. I lean Adesanya, but that's a that's a solid fight on paper, man. This is a big moment for Israel Adesanya. If he can win this fight, dual champion, uh, who knows what he would do next? You know, he's still if he's still making noise about fighting John, he might follow John up to heavyweight, which would be a really weird thing, but he might do it. Um. I mentioned this before. He won't hold both belts. The UFC just... You're not... As, as long as you have two divisions that are real, you are not going to have a double champion across two real divisions. It's just not feasible. And light heavyweight may not be a great division, but it's a real division. And middleweight is a good division. Uh, the, the plus side for Adesanya, as far as middleweight goes, is he's beaten most of them. <laughs> not most, but he's beaten a lot of them already. I mean, the next contender for the middleweight belt is theoretically Whitaker, who he already knocked out cold in the second round. Uh, I wouldn't hate a rematch. I've ma I think I've said that before. I, w I don't hate the idea of those two fighting again. But it does say a little bit about the division that, you know, Adesanya's done what he's done. So, that's your main event. Really good fight on paper. Co-main event, Amanda Nunes will be defending the UFC women's featherweight title against Megan Anderson. I would need a very compelling reason to pick against Amanda Nunes here, and I do not think Megan Anderson provides a compelling argument. <laughs> Megan has power. She's a legitimate 145-pound fighter. She's tall. She's long. Both of which, if she's able to really kind of keep the fight long, might give Nunes some trouble. Uh, Nunes hasn't been the smaller fighter in a while. Uh, certainly not to the potential reach disadvantage she will be at here. So that might be something to keep an eye on. Uh, but Nunes is a very a very sophisticated striker. She's not just a brawler. She hits very, very hard. She fights well in the clinch. She fights well on the ground. She's an... In I, I need a very, very good reason to pick against Amanda Nunes, and I don't see that here. Uh, I, I don't mean to be dismissive of Megan Anderson... And she might shock the world. You know, Nunez is a little bit hittable. Um, I mean, Holly Holm had some success before she got, uh, before getting head kicked. But I, if Anderson can't land a really, really good punch at long range, uh, she's going to be in for a short night, I tend to think. I mean, Anderson got out-wrestled and out-grappled by Holly Holm, and Nunez is a significantly better grappler than Holly Holm. I don't think that's a, I don't think that's a controversial sentiment. So I, I imagine Nunez wins here, keeps on rolling. Uh, I don't know who's going to beat Nunez eventually. She might just retire with both belts. Uh, but you know, Nunez is the best woman on the planet. <laughs> like, I don't think that's I don't think that's much in dispute. Uh, maybe if you get a third fight between her and Shevchenko, Shevchenko could could uh, pull. Could make a more definitive case in her favor uh, in a third fight, but uh, even that kind of remains to be seen. 
All right, our third fight, third title fight. Love this fight. UFC bantamweight champion Peter Yan will be fighting Aljamain Sterling. Heck yes. You have the undisputed champion. You have the number one contender. You have a pit bull in Yan, a, stri- a, a mostly forward pressure, but not exclusively striking machine with good boxing, good kicking, fights from either stance, good wrestling, you know, a solid clinch game, and a man who has been impossible to beat in the UFC, only has one loss in his entire career that he avenged uh, in very emphatic fashion. He lost a split decision to Magomed Magomedov in their first fight. The rematch was not as close. That was a that was a unanimous decision win for Jan, fairly clearly. Uh, been on a tear in the UFC. He's beaten some really good guys too, especially his last few fights. Uh, had one of the better fights of all last year when he beat Jose Aldo. Then you have Aljamain Sterling, a long bantamweight. You know, Sterling is rangy. He's good about kind of kicking and prodding you at distance with a exceptional grappling game. Really great back takes, really good work, really good at, you know submission attempts from the back. Smothers you if he gets on top. Uh, this is a great, great fight. I, I have no idea. I have no idea who's going to win this fight. Both men are exceptionally capable fighters. There were a lot of very, very smart people, smarter than me, who, uh, after, uh, what was it? After Cejudo won the bantamweight belt, there was a bit of a, well, who's going to, who has the best chance at beating Cejudo at 135? A lot of people who know a lot more than I do were going, I think it's Aljamain Sterling. You got a guy who can fight really long, who can wrestle, maybe not maybe not pure wrestle to the level of Henry Cejudo. There's very few people in the UFC that can do that. But whose overall grappling acumen would give Cejudo some serious pause about you know, recklessly entering into clinches or takedowns. And who's r- become very, very good at doing kind of a John Jones impression at uh, at distance. Single shot, high variance offense. Uh, this is and it, this is a great fight. I can't wait for this fight. I, I genuinely can't wait. Uh, since I do kind of, since I do say which way I lean and whatnot, uh, this is as close to a pick em as I... Uh, I could make a very, very cogent argument for either guy. I really could. For the sake of argument, I will lean towards Jan, I guess. But uh, I, I no faith in that as far as predictions go. I, I might le- I lean a little bit Jan, but it's a great fight, man. Great fight. Can't wait for that one. All right, two more fights on the main card here: Islam Makashev and Drew Dober. Uh. This is a good fight. You have Makashev, who only has one loss in his entire career. He got caught a little bit cold by Adriano Martins but has, in his second fight in the UFC, but has rattled off, what, six in a row since? Yeah. Uh, including a couple of finishes. He knocked out Glayson Tebow. He tapped out Cajun Johnson. Out-wrestled Armin Sarukian, and that win has aged very well, given what Sarukian's been doing recently. And beat Davi Hamosh in September of 2019. He was supposed to fight somebody else, wasn't he? Yeah, he was supposed to fight Rafael Dos Anjos uh, in October of last year. Unfortunately, that fell through. Uh, so you've got Makashev, who is one of the rising guys at lightweight. You have Drew Dober, who's been in the UFC for a while, but finally seems to be kind of putting everything together. He's 6-1 and one in his last seven. That one loss was to Benil Taryush. He's finished his last three opponents. Uh, he's a tough guy to take down. He's a very, very competent kickboxer. Uh, you have a very clear dynamic here, the old striker versus grappler dichotomy. Uh, I do tend to favor Makashev, but I'm not sleeping on Dober here, man. If Makashev can't force this to be... Uh, you know, clinch and grappling heavy he could be in for a long night and kicking off the main card I kind of mentioned it earlier Tiago Santos and Alexander Rakic 
Uh, Santos just returned from that really long... I mean, he was out for 18 months, give or take. A really long time after the horrific knee injuries he suffered when fighting John Jones. And then lost pretty badly to Glover to share. I mean, he had a few moments, but he lost that fight. Um, we'll see if he's finally kind of on the rebound after that, because Alexander Rakic is nobody's stepping stone. Rakic's only loss in the UFC was a split decision to Volkan Uzdemir that I seem to recall thinking he won. Uh, he has finished a couple of guys in the UFC. He beat Anthony Smith in his last fight. Uh, not an easy thing to do, and he looked... That was a lot of one-way traffic in that fight. Um, again, neither of these gentlemen is a stepping stone uh, by choice. If you're gonna if you're gonna make your name at their expense, you're gonna earn that. Uh, I'm I'm still a pretty big believer in Rakic. I wonder how Santos's legs are gonna hold up to the leg kicks because Rakic kicks very hard. I mean, uh, Smith mentioned that about him. He took. I think one of those things was you know he I took a. You know, took like double-digit leg kicks from Hector Lombard and didn't care one iota. I got kicked in the calf like four times by Rakic and my leg broke. Uh, so Rakic, I lean Rakic here. Uh, lean. But for a light heavyweight, uh, it's a relevant fight. Uh, there, there's a lot of uncertainty at light heavyweight, depending on what Adesanya does, if he wins, depending on what Blahovic. If Blahovic wins, things get a little bit clearer. I think you just get due to share a Blahovic. I think that's... Isn't it a rematch? Need to double-check that. I feel like they fought. I might be mistaken, though. Might be one of the few guys, guys Glover hasn't fought. No, they haven't. So, yeah, if... If Blahovic wins, you do to share Blahovic, and you keep the wheels turning with the winner of Rakic Santos probably having next after that, or maybe even having that, maybe having to have one more fight. If Adesanya wins, uh, it's a little bit trickier. If he wins and decides he doesn't want to keep the 205 belt, I would probably do to share up. Look, to share has to be part of that equation. Uh, he's earned that. I might do to share if Rakic wins. I, I do to share a Rakic for the vacant belt. And then you know, give Blahovich one more, uh, or you do to share Blahovich again. There's not a lot of ways to go wrong there. If Adesanya wins and wants to retain the and wants to defend the 205 belt, then it's him and Teixeira. Uh, again, Teixeira should have next up. But uh, again, question marks around who's gonna do what. Anyway, that's your main card. Uh, all killer, no filler. Closest thing to filler you have is Nunes and Anderson and. It's a title fight. Uh, so, I'm not going to call it filler. Right, as for the prelims. Uh, main event in the prelims, we have Dominic Cruz and Casey Kenny. This is the first three-round fight for Dominic Cruz since he fought Takeya Mizugaki in 2014. Every fight since then has been five rounds. Uh, in fact, every fight since then has been a title fight. He won the belt, defended the belt, lost the belt, fought for the belt, uh, and lost uh, in the Cejudo fight. Um, I feel okay picking Cruz here. Here's kind of my thing about this. Casey Kenny has looked fairly good in his UFC run thus far. He's only got one loss. That was to Murab Dwalis, really. Um, he's looked really good in his last couple of fights. He's not in... Uh, I say this. He's a strong kicker. He's a tough guy to really kind of get a hold of. I won't. I will not be shocked if he wins. Um, not what I'm expecting. But Cruz. I mean, my. I have a tremendous amount of respect for Dominic Cruz as a fighter, as an analyst, as you know, a contributor to the fight game and to what MMA has become. I think he is someone who we will look back on uh, and appreciate what he did to, not only what he accomplished as a fighter, but the ways in which he changed the game. But he's 35. He is... He's a little bit older than I am. Um, and by a little bit, I mean a number of months. We were both born in the same year. He is... He has dealt with some serious injuries and serious layoff. That's all 
you know, public knowledge. I that's going to catch up, you know. That whether Kenny is the guy to potentially punish, uh, uh, you know, take advantage of that, that remains to be seen. Kenny's a young guy uh, in the in his career. He's only what 29. Yeah, he's 29. Uh, been in the UFC for just over two years. His UFC debut was in March of 19. He's been active, man. He fought a bunch in... Tw he fought four times in 2020. Jeez. So, remains to, so, again, remains to be seen a little bit. I'm okay picking... I feel okay picking Cruz here. But if Father Time is coming knocking, then... Uh, if Cruz loses this, it will probably be time for him to be done. Um, and I don't say that as to, as a, to demean... Kenny is like, eh, you know, if you're losing to that guy, you might want to be done. But at 35, with all the injuries and all the miles, uh, this is an important fight for Cruz. If he wants to remain a, a relevant fighter in the division, he can't lose this fight. All right, also bantamweight, Song Yudong and Kyler Phillips. I don't have a whole lot of tremendous uh, trepidation around picking Song Yudong to win that. He might lose it, but I'm okay picking him. Uh, Song still is not lost in the UFC. I mean, Chito Vera gave him a pretty good fight, but uh, he had the one draw against Cody Stamen. So, but other than that, uh, no losses in the UFC. Uh, at flyweight, really good fight here actually. Joseph Benavidev and Askar Askarov. A big fight for both of these gentlemen. Askarov has never lost. He is 12 and 0 with one draw. Coming off of a, he's had some. His last couple of wins have been big. He's, uh, he's two zero and he's two and zero with one draw in the UFC. The wins over Tim Elliott and Alexandre Pantoja have both been very solid. Uh, this is a step up for him though, and for Joseph Benavidez, a guy who is 36, coming off of his first ever losing streak, and he was finished badly in both of those fights with Davis and Figueredo. And we're talking about a guy, again, 39, made his professional debut in 2006, so he's had a long career. A very successful career, too, if you look at all that he's accomplished. Uh, but, man, those uh, yeah. those Figueredo losses were bad. He got smashed. I mean, he just got smashed in those fights. Now, Askarov is not a smashing machine like Davis and Figueredo is. <laughs> Uh, in fact, you know, this is the kind of fight that if Benavidez is still on top of his game is very, very winnable for him. Askarov is kind of a one-dimensional guy a little bit. He is very, very good at that one dimension, by the, <laughs> to be very clear. But you know, if all you come at Joseph Benavidez with is wrestling, he's beaten guys like that in the past. So uh, we'll have to see how that plays out. I don't like picking against Benavidez in fights like this. He tends to win them. But I am kind of... I, I do kind of like what Askarov's been showing. Um, this might be, you know, one of those prospect losses where he is a little bit in over his head and learns from it and comes back even better, but I'm leaning Askarov. Let's see. Another flyweight fight, Rogerio Bonterin and Kai Kara France. Bonterin coming off of a loss to Ray Borg. Whereas Carter France had a lot of hype when he came into the UFC. Had a long winning streak, and he's had some setbacks. Coming off of that loss to Brandon Royville. That was a wild fight, man. Um, I like Carter France here a little, uh, but man, he's... He needs to... Uh, this is an important fight for him. If he drops this, there's a serious question about how far he can go in the UFC. And kicking off this portion of the prelims, Livia Hanata Souza and Amanda Lemos. Um, I don't really have a good handle on Souza. I mean, she's very good. She's only got two losses professionally. Won a split decision with Hill for the uh, for the Invicta title. And she lost to Brianna Van Buren, who's turned out to be pretty good. Uh, whereas Lemos... 
Well, on a two-fight winning streak. Undefeated since moving to straw weight. I'm going to pick Sousa, but... Hmm. Sousa, need, if she's going to make a serious run of this, she needs to she needs to make a statement here. Then as for the early prelims, there's a lot of fights on this card. Jeez, how many fights do we have? We got five, ten. They're seriously throwing a 15-fight card with three title fights at the top? What are you doing? You're going to kill your audience, man. That might mean that literally. Anyway, Tim Elliott versus Jordan Espinoza. Kind of a must-win for Tim Elliott. He's, I mean, he's coming off a win, but he lost three in a row before that. Uh, and Espinoza. Uh, this is kind of a... Again, this is a little bit of a win-or-go-home fight for Elliott. Uh, Espinoza does not have a very good UFC record. I'll pick Elliott, but... Um, if he's slipping as much as it's looked like he's slipping... Uh, Espinoza can win that fight. Light heavyweight, Kennedy and Chuck Wu against Carlos... Carlos Ulberg. Why is this fight happening? <laughs> Ulberg is 3-0, and coming in off of a uh, win on the Contender Series, and Chuck Wu's gone like 0-2 in the UFC, 0-3, I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, he might have one win, actually, now that I think about it. He might be 1-2. and two. Uh, This is not a good fight. <laughs> It's just not a good fight. I, I don't know who's going to win. I don't care. Welterweight, Sean Brady and Jake Matthews. Mm, what's Matthews done? Done lately. He's on a three-fight winning streak. God, he somehow managed to not finish Diego Sanchez in 2020. That was... I will never for the life of me understand some of his decision-making there. Uh, Brady... Undefeated, 3-0 in the UFC. Hmm. Oh. Uh, okay, I, oh no, sorry, I, I remember. Sh I'm going to pick Sean Brady, actually, now that I think about it. Brady's pretty legit. Um, yeah, I'm going to go with Brady, but that's a, that's a pretty good fight. Lightweight fight between Alon Cruz and Urso Medic. Um... I'm probably butchering that gentleman's name. Let me look at where he's from. That might help me decide how badly I'm doing that. Um, I believe that is the Serbian flag. It is. Yay me. I'm going to go with Medic until I hear otherwise. Um, anyway, he's 6-0, and coming in off the Contender Series. Cruz is 8-3. and uh, Came into the Contender Series, lost to Spike Carlisle. I have no idea. You're dealing with very, very... Uh, you're dealing with very green fighters there. Oh, yeah, let me double-check in Chukwu. Oh, yeah, and Chukwu beat Doc, um, Darko Stasic, so he's 1-1 one one in the UFC. Whatever. Uh, but for the record, uh, to be to be accurate there, I'll go with Medic, I guess, Silver Cruz. But yeah, again, you're talking about very very developing fighters in some respects still there. And I believe kicking everything off, yes, we have Mario Bautista and Trevin Jones. Uh, Jones, another one of the Guam contingent. I seem to recall. What happened to his fight? He, oh yeah, he had that. He got beat up by Timur Valiev and then uh, came back and won. But that got changed. Where did they get changed to a no contest? I need to. I need to. Conf I need to. Fi I need to see what that was. I think it was a drug test failure, but I can't remember which one. I mean, if it was, because if it was just marijuana, then I genuinely don't care. The Munoz Edgar card. The no contest. Yeah, it was marijuana. Oh, jeez. Thankfully, that seems to potentially be a thing of the past. We are kind of moving away from that stupidity. Uh, and Bautista lost to Corey Sandhagen, won two in a row since. 
probably go with John's again. What is John's? Double check John's. Uh, or Jones, rather. Excuse me, Trevin Jones. Jesus, that guy. Okay, he his most recent losses have been split decisions. Hmm. Yeah, I'll go with Jones, but uh, that's bantamweight, so that could go either way. There, that's a lot of talent at bantamweight as far as that goes. All right, anyway, 15 fights, three title fights. That's going to be a seven-hour event. Lord help us all. But I will have coverage in the MMA Zone of 411 Mania, so please on Saturday stop by, say hello, help keep me sane as I plod through that. Oof. All right, uh, let's get on to some news. We have a few different points, and let's try to move quickly. Um, a lot of news coming out. I think Jorge, uh, I think Jorge Mosfit, I'll mention this in an interview, his uh, rematch with Kamaru Usman is being scheduled for September, or targeted for September. That would essentially all but confirm that those two will be coaching the Ultimate Fighter. Uh, why? Just why? Just why? Um, look, if there's a legitimate reason that that fight couldn't happen until September anyway, then whatever, but... We're going to we're going to shelf that fight for 7 months give or take for the enormous waste of space that is the ultimate fighter. Ugh. Ugh. That's all I have to say about that. Um you know that said, uh you know Masvidal represents probably the biggest monetary opportunity for uh for Usman at bantamweight. Might be a little bit of a toss-up between him and Covington, but I think Mosfid, but Mosfidal and Usman, on very short notice, did a lot of business. So, Usman wanting to potentially run that back, and the way Usman's looked, uh, he, I said this before, Mosfidal can still win that fight. Uh, in fact, if he's able to kind of buzz uh, Usman the same way Gilbert Burns was early in the first, Mosfidal, his finishing instincts are different than those of Burns. Uh, if, he if Usman finds himself in that position again, uh, things might go differently. I mean, that said, Usman is not going to fight Mosfidal the same way he fought Burns. There's very, very different considerations there. I still I still favor Usman in that fight, but again, won't be shocked if Mosfidal wins. Anyway, so there's that fight potentially for September. Um, if it happens, I'm, I'm certainly okay with it. Uh, look, man, you're basically only picking rematches for Usman at this point. He's beaten not everyone in that division, but he's beaten a lot of that division. I think we even mentioned he's beaten like seven of the top ten guys. Yeah, there's a lot of retreads that are in his future if he sticks around at welterweight. And I imagine he will, but... uh. And look, like I said, Masvidal makes the most money. Uh, he is pretty easily the biggest star that division has. So, if you've got your others and your Usman, take the fight that'll make you the most money. I, I don't hold that against him one iota. Uh, all right, we also got officially announced for UFC 261, the fly the women's flyweight title will be on the line. Champion Valentina Shevchenko defending against Jessica Andrade. Uh, yeah, right fight to make. Good fight on paper. Really tough fight for Andrade. I think Shevchenko could very easily do a lot of what Ioana did to Andrade. A lot of matador, a lot of sniping at distance, a lot of getting Andrade to walk on to stuff, because Andrade is going to come forward. She is strong as an ox. Uh, uh, she has power. She hunts the body and head. You know, Andrade is not an easy fight. There are some fighters who have made it look a little bit easier than others, but that's not an easy fight. I still favor Shevchenko fairly heavily, but right fight to make given all the players involved. Uh, look forward to it. They're also kind of talking about Weili Zhang and Rosnama Yunus for UFC 261, so you would, you could get uh, you get a double women's title fight, you know, for uh, set up for that event. And 
I don't know if the UFC would try to set up something between Zhang and uh, Shevchenko in terms of even narrative, but they might. Uh, whether that would be Shevchenko going down or Zhang going up, both are... Shevchenko said in the past that maybe she could make 115. I'm a little bit suspect of that claim until I see evidence of it, but... I mean, I, if there, I mean, either way, I wouldn't object to Zhang moving up. Uh, I don't like her chances against Shevchenko, but I don't like anyone's chances against Shevchenko. I mean, even Nunes, who I would probably favor to win, I wouldn't necessarily say that, you know, her chances are great. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, yeah, so that's kind of what UFC 261 is looking like at the moment. Could be fun. Uh, and our last bit of news, UFC President Dana White is continuing to play uh, ostrich. Khabib did an interview with a Russian news outlet over the last week or so. And uh, he talked about not just being gone, because he, you know, he stuck to his guns about saying he's retired. Someone asked him about, you know, okay, you're retired for the moment. Would you ever consider coming back in the future? And he gave an interesting response. He said no, but he said because I don't think I could ever be as great as I am now. Uh, he doesn't want to return as a diminished version of himself. You know, he even mentioned it. Kind of, kind of dovetailed into GSP a little bit because GSP is 40. And one of the things he said was, you know, you've got to be, you know, the lighter weight classes especially. It's a younger fighter's game. You have to, you have to be the younger guy. You know, you look at George. You know, now at this point he's 40. You know, it's over. He's not coming back. That's pr you know, probably true. And if he's kind of dismissing George, that's the one fight that you thought maybe you could lure him out of his, uh, you know, retirement. That's th that's what he's calling it. Uh, would be a fight with GSP, but uh, does not seem to be happening. He's he's kind of held the line as far as no, I'm done. Uh, of course, again, Dana White's continued to say, no, we're not moving on from Khabib. He's mentioned that, you know, we're certainly exploring the possibility of a trilogy fight between Dustin Poirier and Conor McGregor. Uh, but there would not be a title on the line. You know, there's there's not a whole lot that I see in combat sports anymore that really kind of riles me up. But the UFC is doing Dustin Poirier dirty here. That man should have been champion when he beat Conor. Straight up. I, I mentioned this last week or a couple of weeks ago. I really do wonder what exactly is going on that the UFC is being so obstinate about this. They've moved on from other big money-making opportunities in terms of singular fights. And, uh, again, none of those individual fights represented what, you know, Conor Khabib 2 would... Re not Conor Khabib. Yeah, Conor Khabib 2 would represent that... Might be the biggest fight in the history of the sport. Their first fight certainly was. But, I don't know. It, it it does feel like there's something else going on there for them to be this stubborn about it. And, again, Poirier's the one kind of getting screwed over here. He, His fight with Conor should have been for the vacant belt. I don't have a good reason why it wasn't. Uh, that man should be champion right now. His next fight should be for the vacant belt, if nothing else. And now it's not even looking like that's going to happen. Um, I don't know. I don't know. That's uh, that's a weird thing. And you've also kind of... I mean, you've also got... Uh, you Daniel Cormier telling Dana... Uh, this is one of the things that was somewhat public recently. Cormier telling Dana... Don't give up on Khabib. Look, Daniel Cormier is not the worst comment, uh, the worst guy in the booth that the UFC has. His style doesn't appeal to me very much, but he's not the worst. But man, he... And, and so look, he's getting a paycheck from ESPN for that gig. He's getting a paycheck for them because of his show with Ariel Helwani. He's become a bit of a show. Now... When you're talking about job security, if part of your job security is shilling, maybe it just comes with the territory. But know that he's a bit of a shill when it comes to stuff like this. He is backing the UFC's interests over everything else. 
But you know, Khabib continuing to say, no, brother, it's over. It's done. Um, I... I wonder what I wonder why the UFC isn't pulling the trigger on this. You know, they are This is the first time the UFC is publicly saying Fighter X is more important than the architecture and the machinery that we have built. Every other time we've been in something like this. It's okay, fine, move on. It's we want to do X you know, look, if Dana said we want to do Conor Khabib too, of course we do. It's a huge fight. It would make both guys a ton of money. It would make us a ton of money, et cetera, et cetera. If, if that's what he said, but, you know, Khabib doesn't want the belt right now, so we're moving on. That's That's been the line before. You know, Ronda stepped away after getting knocked out by Holly. You know, the UFC's line was, no, we're going to do the rematch. We should lose our promoter's license if we don't. They didn't. Um, you know, I mentioned before, Johnny Hendricks and GSP. GSP, one of the bigger stars the UFC had. Dana, after the fact, you know, now George owes it to the sport. He owes it to the fans. He owes it to Johnny. GSP said, no, I don't. <laughs> I'm, I'm taking a hiatus. And the UFC clearly wanted that rematch, but when George, when George's position was clear... Fine. You know, he he said he's done. He knew he was giving up the belt. Uh, Johnny Hendricks and Robbie Lawler. Uh, you know, when they stripped Connor of the lightweight belt, I mean, they always knew they were going to get him in there for the next title fight, sure, but, you know, Connor, biggest star in the sport. It's, you know, okay, fine. Uh, you know, we've got, here it is, take it, you know, take it away, and it's on the line between Tony and Khabib. They just have been willing to move on before in ways that they are not for Khabib, and I don't know why that is. Uh, and That's, to me, an endlessly... I shouldn't say endlessly, but it's something I really do kind of want to know about. I want to know what's up with that. But that saga continues to be ongoing, and as new avail information becomes available, we'll keep you updated here. Although if I'm your sole source of news for the MMA world, I would urge you to... Follow other, read other sites, follow other stories. Uh, I'm just kind of, I'm a little bit of a polemicist when it comes to breaking news like that. So, yeah, there's that. All right, let's have a quick look through the news, see if anything crazy has broken while we've been recording, and then if not, we'll get out of here. All right, nope, nothing MMA related seems to have broken, so let us get out of here with plugs. All right, last week, I did a Damn You Hollywood with Mark Radulich for I Care A Lot, the Netflix movie that apparently won Rosamund, just not, just nabbed Rosamund Pike a Best Actress for her performance at the Golden Globes. Uh, baffles me. I would have given that, I would have given that to every other person nominated in that category before her, but I don't know, maybe that's just me. I mean, clearly it's just me. So you can find my, our review of that. Uh, we have a review this week coming up for Tom and Jerry, which was recently released. So we'll have some fun talking about that. And what else do I have? Coverage as usual on Friday in the Wrestling Zone for SmackDown. Saturday for UFC 259. I want to say there was another podcast I did last week. But for the life of me, I can't remember. No, I did the I care a lot. I I must have been the week before that I did that I did a couple of different ones. I think that was it. Anyway, that's what you've got coming up for me in this particular week. So hope y'all stay safe out there. We'll be back next week. We'll unpack all the action from UFC 259. That's sure to be just a lot of stuff to unpack from that. I'm sure, one way or the other. We will also. Have a preview for, will we? Or is that the week they're taking off? Hang on, I must confirm this. So the 7th, yeah. We'll have a preview for UFC Fight Night uh, 187, UFC and ESPN Plus 45. This is the event headlined at the moment by Leon Edwards and Bilal Muhammad. Muhammad stepping in for uh, Kamzat Shemaev as Shemaev is still dealing with COVID issues. 
So we'll have a full preview of that next week. That is, uh, where's that card look? Look, yeah, it's not great. It's not great, but it's not awful. Yeah, no, that's not awful. So, full preview next week of my thing I've now declared to be, eh, could be worse. <laughs> all right, I will see you all then. Thank you all very much again. Stay safe out there as usual, and please continue to be well, be safe, and behave.